I'm very happy to, uh, to be able to introduce uh, Serge Witch, who's a uh, professor at Liverpool John Moores University. Uh, he's a, an ecologist uh, who studies both the behavior of primates and the ecology of, of forests, uh, primarily in Indonesia, but also elsewhere in the world. Uh, he's also one of the co-founders of Conservation Drones, uh, which is a pioneering group which is, does exactly what its name sounds like. Um, Serge, I think, has both done tremendous work himself and has a very good command of the work that other scientists, uh, ecologists, uh, environmental scientists um, have been doing around the world with drones where I, there's really been an, an explosion over the last two, three, four years where there's, a, there's already a pretty vast scientific literature uh, which Serge uh, talks about sort of a wonderful read in in a chapter in, in, in this uh, book that we're putting out today. Uh, so without further ado, I'll let Serge uh, speak to us a little bit about his work and conservation and drones more generally. Thanks, Serge. Thank you. Well, th uh, thank you very much for inviting me and for the wonderful introduction. So uh, I'm an ecologist, uh, uh, and um, I spend uh, most of my life doing pretty low-tech work. Uh, I camp out in the forest and with pen and paper and, and more recently with a GPS we collect data to find out where animals are and to do ground truthing for satellite images. And that's all very good and fun but it's very slow, it's very expensive because sometimes it takes us two weeks to get to one data point which is not very efficient. Um, mostly uh, my work has been focused in Indonesia on orangutans and as many of you know, the landscape where these animals occur and many other animals around the world is changing very rapidly. So it becomes more difficult to map that as these changes go very fast. So we need to find out where these animals are and where uh, their habitat is and how it changes into um, areas that are not particularly suitable for them, but in which they still might occur. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, I met up with uh, Professor Leon Pinko and we thought it would be wonderful if we can just fly over these forests and collect data with uh, drones. So we started with the approach that, that Gregory and, and others have mentioned uh, as well, uh, do-it-yourself systems, because we wanted it to be affordable, fixable in the field, and available uh, for a reasonable price for local conservation NGOs and local communities that we uh, were planning to train. Over the past few years, we've been training people in about I don't know, 25 countries. And uh, a lot of that work um, focuses on basically three things that we're trying to do with conservation. One of the aims is to count wildlife. The other thing is to map uh, the areas where these animals occur and how that landscape is changing. And the last uh, effort is focused on, on anti-poaching, uh, which, is, which is an increasingly uh, large problem uh, in Africa, but also in, in, in Southeast Asia. Um, so uh, when people try to count wildlife, one of the main aims that we try to uh, accomplish was to count orangutan nests, which orangutans, like any great ape, make a nest every night or a sleeping platform. And uh, we try to find those um, on aerial images, which works really quite uh, well. So in addition to that, um, we do a lot of ground truthing to see whether the aerial data that we get is actually comparable to ground data. So are densities and distributions similar? So can we actually really use drone-based data as an alternative to ground-based data? And in this image, you can just see that we collected a lot of nest locations in the field, overlaid those with, with one of these high-resolution ortho mosaics, and then put the aerial nests on there as well, the yellow stars. And there's a very good correlation in the number of nests you get per transect from the ground and from aerial-based platforms. So this looks as a very promising technique to really uh, uh, be used as an alternative to ground-based uh, analyses and obtain data that is a much higher resolution than uh, Landsat data as well in terms of uh, mapping. Um, of course, many people are interested in just observing animals and finding out where uh, they are. So we've been taking pretty pictures of animals in, in many different areas for many different projects. And of course, as you start collecting these pictures, you, after a while, realize that you're collecting lots of pictures. And 
you're supposedly trying to be more efficient, but then what do you do with all those pictures? In the beginning, we went through them manually, and that was fun for the first 100 pictures. <laughs> but then you're like, hmm, this is not really the future. So uh, we started to, to talk to colleagues and uh, are now interacting with people from computer vision uh, labs to, to do automatic object recognition for things like orangutan nests, counting uh, birds automatically in, in images, um, counting cows and and my m most recent collaboration is with my my neighbor actually who's an astronomer at the same university and we're using the algorithms they use to find stars to automatically detect animals in thermal imaging uh, 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 videos and and photos so it, it's it's really exciting that this this field brings together lots of different disciplines, which for, for a scientist like myself is, is great fun and, and a good intellectual challenge because it sort of broadens your horizon. Um, so there's a lot more to be done there. There's also a lot more to be done uh, for land cover mapping. I totally agree that it's fairly easy to fly over these areas now, get high resolution maps, get photos that illustrate differences between a diverse forest and a more homogeneous uh, patch of, of land uh, near a lake. Um, and you can try to identify trees on these images. But this is also a lot of manual work still if you want to try to um, look at change detection or do land cover classification. That still requires quite a bit of work. And one of the things that we're trying to do is we're, we're posting all our maps on, on Google Maps Engine, so we can link it to the Google uh, Earth Engine where we can do classification. So we're hoping to get at some stage to a sort of an easier workflow where you can get these ortho mosaics and then have trained algorithms that can automatically classify areas that are our primary forest, logged forest, oil palm plantations, etc., so that we don't really need to do all that uh, manually and, and, and in different software packages. But getting to one workflow for that is something that I think is very important for the future. Um, we're also very much aware that uh, drones stay in the air for a limited amount of time and that therefore they can't uh, map the same amount of areas that uh, satellites can map. So we're trying to use drone data as training data to improve the land cover classification from satellite images. And that's, uh, oh, whoop, um, that's working quite uh, well. I won't go into details, but you can see that the accuracy of land cover classification improves uh, as you start to use uh, drone data as training data for these classifications. And I think that's an exciting field because there's not so much work going on on that. And I think that will help a lot so that we actually see these technologies not as uh, alternatives, but as complementary to each other. Uh, and I think that's something that could use quite a bit more effort. Um, we're of course also using these structure for motion things uh, to make these three dimensional maps of forest, which is great for us because then all of a sudden we can map the size of trees, we can map the size of gaps, we get a, a view that we never had before uh, of the areas where we work. It, in a way, it's poor man's LIDAR, but it still is quite, quite good. Um, because it allows us to, for instance, this is a study area that I work in in Sumatra, to derive tree heights from uh, these, these structure for motion maps. And that allows us to, for instance, look at where orangutans travel and where potential corridors are for wildlife. And that's also uh, data that we, we couldn't really collect uh, earlier. Um, so we do a lot of these uh, maps. We do use RGB cameras. A lot of people are using near infrared cameras to, to help land use classification and to produce these what they call NDVI maps, which gives you information about the photosynthetic activity of, of plants. So the greener uh, areas in these images are areas where there's more trees uh, than the blue areas and where there's more photosynthetic activity. And that's also very useful data for conservation people and of course also for 
uh, agronomists. Um, sort of the last uh, part that we focus on is, is, is uh, poaching. We're, we're trying to use these systems uh, and train uh, local um, uh, poaching, uh, anti-poaching uh, teams, uh, in this case in Nepal, where there's uh, tigers, elephants, and rhinos, and we're trying to, we've trained uh, them there to use these systems and um, operate them to be part of their management. And uh, we started with that in 2012. Uh, now it's 2015, we're in the third year that there's no poaching in that area. Of course, that's probably not causally linked to using drones, but it's part of a, a toolkit that they now have that can work to reduce uh, poaching. And it, it might potentially uh, only be uh, sort of a deterrence in, in, in some cases where it's publicized widely in the media that these systems are being used now. And so that people are maybe not going into these national parks anymore because the, the, the risk is just uh, a little bit higher. Um, of course, with, with, with poachers, it's very difficult to, to find them, particularly if they're, if they're under the rainforest, even with thermal imaging cameras, you will not penetrate uh, through because there's a lot of cloud coverage in between. So one of the things we're trying to do is to uh, use these systems to detect smoke plumes from drying racks that poachers are using to, to dry bushmeat. This is particularly uh, an issue in Africa uh, where poachers go in for a week, they dry bushmeat, then they come out with the dried bush meat, but these smoke plumes uh, give their position uh, away. So this might potentially be really good. Um, uh, this is the one slide that never wants to. Uh, okay, so the, we fly over these areas and then you see these smoke plumes and you can basically see them from, from a few kilometers away. So this could potentially be very effective, particularly if you um, would use small quadcopters to just fly up Oh, let's see if this runs. No. Well, particularly if you have small quadcopters, you can just send them up, do a 360 above the canopy, and you can detect where those smoke plumes are. You know the compass or in the degrees where these smoke plumes are, and then patrol teams can go to those areas, and that's much more efficient than what they're doing at the moment, which is more or less a sort of a random walk through the forest in, in, in some cases. There's many people working on anti-poaching uh, efforts uh, uh, around the world uh, here in, in Washington. Uh, Thomas Snitch is working uh, on that um, in Africa. Um, so there's lots of, of exciting things that are going on in, in the conservation world, and there's lots of uh, things that, that I think will need to happen to, uh, to help this effort more and one of them is is increased flight duration particularly for multi rotors which which people already have said they're easier to fly you need less landing space and, and their flight duration is increasing so that's uh, we now have systems that can can fly for about 40 minutes fly 10 kilometers so that that's quite a lot better than than one or two kilometers so that that will will change the way that that um, we can use these systems in terms of the, the ease it is to use these systems, but also uh, where you can apply them. Um, I think we'll, we'll see a lot of rapid developments in, in all sorts of sensors, uh, regular cameras, thermal imaging, uh, multispectral, hyperspectral, LIDAR, and, and that will be exciting because we can just fit those, uh, more of those on, on small uh, drones. Um, we'll see an in increase in user friendliness all the time, even with the open source. Uh, systems, they're, they're becoming very user-friendly. Uh, even a field like biologist like myself can put one together and, and fly them. Uh, and, and that means it has to be quite easy. Um, the, uh, there's, the improved, uh, there's a need for improved data analyses. Now, there it's still a cumbersome workflow of detecting animals on an imaging, on an image, get the GPS points from that, putting that into some software to create a distribution map or uh, allow for density estimates. So that whole workflow uh, needs to, to be improved and, and I hope that will, uh, will happen over the coming years. I'm quite positive that it will happen. Um, I think another thing that, that we would like to see is, is, uh, is use automatic object detection on drones so that we can use the limited bandwidth that we have to send rangers only the data that they, they need 
not thousands of images of savanna trees, but only an image of a rhino of a poacher so that they know where to go. So I think there's quite a bit of work need to be done there as well. Um, I, I think in the conservation world, nobody is using swarms at the moment. I think that will change rapidly uh, uh, as well. And that will mean we can cover uh, larger areas and we can cover areas uh, for a longer duration, which will be very valuable as well. And uh, the last thing I think is that I hope there will be a lot of integration between all these sensor uh, platforms in a way, drones, cameras on the ground, microphones on the ground, uh, other sensors uh, that are detecting activities on the ground. Uh, so that GPS tags on animals, uh, VHF transmitters, GPS loggers, etc. Uh, now those things are not integrated yet, but I think we'll see a lot of integration in the coming years, and that will be extremely helpful uh, for overall uh, management of, of conservation areas and, and data gathering. Um, and that's where I want to end with a picture of, of the core team of conservation drones. Uh, there's a lot of more information on our website, but I hope this gave you sort of a whirlwind overview of uh, what people are using these systems for uh, in uh, uh, conservation over the past few years. Thank you very much. <laughs> sure. Yeah, if there's questions, please fire away. Uh, Walter. conservation efforts uh, tremendously they might just help uh, the poacher exponentially more than uh, the protectors of the wildlife well, what kind of uh, ideas do you have to prevent the technology actually accelerating co poaching skills um, uh, and, re and and putting the co making the conservation effort even harder than it is now already well, that's a very good point, and it's a concern that many people have. I, I, I think it really depends. There, there's uh, most of the poachers are, are not well funded and uh, will not, for the coming years, be able to use these technologies. Uh, there's, of course, very well funded poaching uh, teams out there that I think will be using these technologies. And I think there, there are even cases where they are already using them. Uh, so it, it, it will really depend on the local context whether we will see poachers using these technologies. And if they will, that will become a very interesting uh, situation for sure that we'll have to deal with uh, in some way or another. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much.